Welcome back everybody, welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about how to set up our type system. So I made a picture for you guys to kind of explain the higher level portion of what our type system is going to be. So here, I'm going to go to the parser. Now if you remember, we have this thing called parse uType. And if you remember, uTypes are basically a way to represent some type in our programming language. So if we go here to the picture, I have a high-level example of how types are going to work in the compiler. So we have several different types. We have fields, we have classes, functions. This also represents like lambda functions or function pointers. Like for instance, if you have a variable called pointer and it's representing a certain function signature, that's also under functions as well. Of course, we have aliases and then we also have literals. And this one's a bit of a weird one. I kind of just hooked it into my type system because it just made things easier for me. But yeah, so basically the way it works is everything, like every bit of type that we have in our type system represents what's called a data entity. So every single type is going to represent some set of data. So when we're processing types and our type system and everything, the reason why we want to do this and the, basically the way, the way it's going to work is we're going to have like field, class, function, and everything else basically implement data entity as a base class. And that's going to represent what's called a uType. So uType again is short for unique type. And we'll see, but doing it this way is very powerful because it really allows you to process a lot of data in your compiler with a lot of ease because you don't really have to care uh, in this instance, like what type of data you're processing. For instance, here's a perfect example. If we have two fields and we're trying to assign one field to another, well, we need to get the U type of each field and compare it. Well, how do you compare it? What if this field is representing a class and the other one's representing a function pointer? Well, how do you basically process all of that information? Well, and instead of creating like this data structure that has a bunch of different pointers like field type, class type, function type, alias type, so on and so forth, and we just basically check to see which of those elements is not equal to null, which that's kind of what I did in my last compiler. Uh, that's not a good way of doing it. Instead, what we want to do is we want to say this field has a uType that's representing some set of data. And the uType will know specifically what data it's handling. So when we try to compare the types of this uType, it just looks at the data entity that it's pointing to, and then it just says, all right, is it a field, a class, or whatever, and then it compares the types that way. So we'll see how that looks in a little bit, but that's kind of what I wanted to show you. So now let's go up to here. So we're going to need to create several different um, things. We're going to need to create several different classes. The first thing we're going to want to do is, well, let me close some of these files. First thing we're going to want to do is create a OO folder, and you also want to create a data folder. The OO folder is short for object oriented, so this is all of our object oriented stuff. And then the data folder represents all of the data that we're going to be processing. So aliases, aliases isn't really like an object oriented thing. Uh, so I guess that's why I put it in here. Um, and then we also have like literals and then we have data entity and of course our U type. So let's start simple and then let's kind of branch out from there. So we're going to start in the data section. So the first thing you're going to want to do is create a data entity header. And what this is going to represent is your data entity class. So and here you can kind of see the uh, imports that I have here. Um, I'll just be briefly showing those, but if you guys are using C-Line, it'll just prompt you to import whatever you're missing. So let's see what we have down here. So first you're gonna want to create an extern int invalid address. And this is defined inside of our data entity class. Now our data entity.cpp class doesn't, or file doesn't really have anything in there. It just has this uh, invalid address. So I'm at the point now where I'm creating ODF files, which is object dump files. And basically what that allows you to do is if I go into here and I can kind of see like what is effectively inside of this file. So this syntax file is the file that I'm working out of and I'm testing my programming language. And obviously it's a bunch of garbage, right? Like I don't know what any of this means. So I use this file to check it. The reason why you want to have this invalid address integer is because once we get to the point to where we can see our object dump files, now most of these functions aren't going to have anything in there because I haven't done anything yet. But like, let's look at this example down here. This is representing an int64 or a uint64 integer class. And we have various data that kind of talks about various things about the function, like what file it's in, what line it was defined at, whatever. But what's important is we have these instructions here. Once we finally generate everything, we want to be able to do a control find for this. So if we look for this number, 
find, obviously I have no results, right? Because I've actually written my compiler correctly. What this is called is this is called a fail safe. You basically set up a red flag to show that something's not initialized. So basically every time when you create a data entity class, it's going to have a invalid address as the address. So the reason why we want that is like I said, if you're trying to access like a local field or some other data type, and we access something that hasn't been compiled yet or it's uninitialized we want to be able to see that in this executable so that way we know that oh i made a mistake in my compiler i need to go and figure out why this is happening and fix it later so this is kind of a little bit forward thinking for this compiler but this is very cool uh, so we're going to need a couple different things for data entity first thing we're going to need is a data type so let's go into here. Our data types are going to be as follows. Now, it's very important to put them in this order because there's a reason for it. Like for instance, let's say I wanted to check to see if my data type was a number. Well, all I have to do is just say, is data type less than or equal to var, right? Because even though function pointers, they're pointing to a function, technically at the low level, all they are are just integers. So that technically is a valid number. So that's why we have all the numbers at the top. And then, you know, we have whether it's an object type, uh, whether it's a nil and then we have others. So I think these kind of speak for themselves um, You can just kind of see what they are this type is for methods So if we are basically compiling a function then the data type of that data entity would be a method if we're compiling a field That's a function pointer the data type of that entity would be a function pointer So there's that of course we have nil right obviously functions can return nothing we also have any now any is a unique interesting type and the reason why we want to do that is let's say we have like let's say we have you know obviously it's a function pointer right if we say equals to this lambda expression we can assign this lambda expression to i don't know args and you know we can do something with these args now obviously the compiler is smart enough to figure out what the type of args is by just looking to the left of the declaration right so once we define our lambda type we look to see what we're assigning it to and inject that type into here so it's effectively like doing this but in the case where we explicitly do not declare what the type of args is as a variable it basically is any type it's not null or it's not nil because we haven't declared what it is we don't know what it is so undefined wouldn't be the appropriate thing to say i use any instead because undefined means that the compiler just doesn't know what it is of course we have untyped as well this is also very important um, this is for our type system when we start resolving fields so this one's a bit more advanced we'll talk about that a little later and then of course you have storage locality so we're going to need that this is for fields but since we're in here i'll just talk about it now the storage locality represents where the field is stored. Is the field stored on the stack or is it stored specifically on a specific thread? So if it's a thread local variable, it would have an STL of thread. Otherwise, if it's just a normal variable, even for like static variables, they have an STL of stack. So there's that. Now let's look at our data entity. So we need to track a couple things. We need to track name, full name, metadata. We've already gone over what metadata is. Uh, so you can check out the previous episode if you want to see about that. Uh, we also have module data. The address or basically how do we access this in memory this guid is basically the serial number so every single data entity that's compiled in our programming language is going to have its own serial number kind of like vehicles right every time there's a new car produced by a manufacturer it comes with a new serial number so that's what this is that guarantees that if we're comparing types we look at the serial number and they're the same that absolutely guarantees that those types are exactly the same type so that's what that is. Um, after that, we have obfuscate. This is going to be a Boolean that tells the code obfuscation system whether or not to obfuscate this piece of data. After that, we have a list of flags. This could technically be an integer and I could do bit shifting, but I was too lazy to do that. So I just made it a list. So let's look at what access flags we have. So we have various different access flags. We have public, private, and protected. I'm sure you guys know what that is. That's used for classes, interfaces, and fields and methods as well. Uh, we have local. This is a specific access flag that denotes that the thing that we're processing can only be accessed and manipulated within the class that it was defined in. This is great for if you have like, for instance, and I think I've talked about this before, but like if you have a, uh, let's say a public or let's not even say public, let's just say number of int and equal to 100. And let's say we want this to be private. I, so 
the problem with this is this is not really actually private and the reason why is because it's defined inside of the platform kernel class if you guys remember how my class structure is laid out this is inside of the SRT global class so technically it would be the same thing as you know this field being defined in this platform class even though this field is private if I assign main.4 to you know some other field that was defined lower at this level I can easily do that right because it makes sense because it's in the same class so we use local to basically fix that where we are specifying it can only be accessed in the class was created in or the file was created in so after that we have uh well we we're going back here so after that we have flg constant the reason why it's not just constant is because this represents a uh defined value and you know this file here so i put flg constant uh so we have that we also have static pretty sure you guys know what that is uh it's just for static access then we have stable and unstable this is going to be for classes only and stable and unstable classes we'll go over it at a later date but that just basically represents whether or not the class is mutatable and we can add extension functions to it after that we have extension class we've talked about this before i believe this is basically just denoting that the class must be inherited in order for it to be instantiated after that we have flag undefined now i want to make something very clear like if you guys notice this was done intentional by the way you can see here public the access flag has a value of one private has a value of two protected has a value of four this is done intentional and here's why if we go to the programmer uh, tab here in this calculator you can see here public is this address private is this bit protected is that one and you know I, i'm pretty sure you guys get the point like it just keeps going up so if we look for instance let's say 0x20 all right if i clear this Oops. So if I clear this and I say, what is it, 0x20, go up to the hex value, type 20. You can see here that represents the static field or the static access flag represents this specific bit. If I say, you know, unstable, that's 0x80, clear this again, 80. That for unstable represents this bit. So as you can see, each flag has its own specific bit. Now, even though it's a list on this end, it's going to be a single integer on the back end, and that's what our virtual machine is going to process. So just keep that in mind. Now, let's go back. After that, we have class object of owner. This basically represents which class is this data set owned by. And of course, finally, we have AST. This is so important. I didn't have this in my last compiler. I'm not even going to talk about why we need this yet because this video will be too long, but just add it. This basically represents what abstract syntax tree that this data set was defined on. So moving on, if we go to the next easiest thing, uh, we can look at literals. So we're going to have various different literal types. We're going to have a numeric literal and a string literal. Of course, we have unknown literals as well. And as you can see, here's going to be the general standpoint on how all of my classes work. We have a class of the type and it's going to have a public data entity, which is going to represent the base class for all of these. And if we go back to data entity, you can notice that data entity has what's called common fields. So the reason why I have data entity as a base class is because it'll hold all of the basic common fields that mostly almost every single type will need to utilize for it to work properly. So literal, it's a bit weird, but like, you know, if we go to like fields, classes, or functions, every field has a name, every field represents a certain type, every field has a full name, and it has an address, same thing with classes and methods. So that's kind of the concept behind this. So first thing you want to do is you're going to want to create a constructor where you initialize data entity, you set the literal type to unknown literal, you set the, oh, and I actually don't think I went over the constructors as well. Um, sorry, I'm bouncing around a little bit. But yeah, so as you can see here, I'm not really going to speak too much on it. You can kind of just pause the video. I don't want this video to drag on too long, but you can kind of see here for address and GUID, I'm setting it to invalid addresses. And also, this is very important for code obfuscation. I'm setting it to obfuscate. So it's whether or not code obfuscation is enabled. So obviously, if code obfuscation is not enabled, which it isn't by default, then basically every single data set that we create is going to be set to false as far as obfuscation goes. So that's very important, just make sure you add that. Um, and of course, every type starts out as untyped before it gets to the undefined. Undefined means the compiler has tried to resolve the type and it is no longer possible 
to figure out what it is. Untyped means it still hasn't been processed yet. After that, we have this one. So this one's a simple one where we're just passing in what type of data we're processing. So everything else is the same. I actually don't know why I'm not passing invalid address here, but uh, we basically just set the type and all of this information is exactly the same as above. Um, so after that, we have our release. Now this function's a bit weird. Now I'm just going to put it out there. I have this really weird bug in my compiler where I leak tons of objects. And I know it's bad. I know it's not the best when it comes to memory and my compiler's not 100% efficient. So I'm doing some very strange things. So this is basically like a free function and it just frees up this data entity. The only thing you really need to free up is the flags because it's a list. After that, we have whether or not it's a var. So as you can see, right, this data entity, I have an isVar function. This is a common function that can be accessed through all of our types. And as you can see, this is why I have lined up my data types in such a way where I'm saying is the type less than or equal to var, then it, it doesn't matter what type it is. Of course, we have copy as well. You guys can copy this down. Basically, I'm just copying all of the fields into this current instance from a separate data entity. Moving on, if we go back to literal, we have our literal constructors. You can see here there's all the basic things. We just set them to their default values, as you can see. Next, we have where we have a string literal. So we pass in some data, and we pass in the address that it was defined at. So we say, here's a string literal, and here's the address that that string literal is defined at. Because of course, if I go back to my syntax, I can check up here to my string section, so this is the string section of my executable. I have multiple different strings. Now, I don't have a ton of strings right now, but like you can see every string has its own specific address, so that's why we want to have that information. Uh, and of course, each string is represented as an int 8 because it's, you know, it's a char, so that's what the type is going to be. After that, we have another constructor where we pass in you know, some data. Now, if you remember, everything in my programming language is represented as a double. So even if you pass an integer, um, we'll still store it as a double. And yeah, so we'll have whatever data set we have. And then you know, we'll default it to var. But if we want to change it to some other type, then we can do that. So that's going to represent a numeric literal. Uh, of course, string data is empty. And you know, we'll set the numeric data. And because numbers don't have addresses, we don't set an address. And yeah, of course we set the type. We also need free. This is going to call release, which just frees up the flags. Now, literals shouldn't have flags anyway, but um, yeah, that's what that's gonna do. So, and then we just set string data equal to nothing. After that, we have aliases. So let's check aliases out. So same thing, you know, this implements data entity or inherited as a base class. Here you can see my imports here. Uh, you can also see classes. Now, there's a reason why, and I didn't mention this before, but there is a very good reason why sometimes I have like these classes defined up here. So I have like class object, AST, field data, module data. C++ is not good when it comes to importing things. Uh, that's why you have to have these stupid if defined statements and defined statements here. If you, for instance, import uh, a class object, so if I import this class object file header here, inside of this data entity class, that's going to cause a circular conflict where basically data entity imports this class object and then the class object class needs to inherit this class. So it also, you know, imports that same file and it's just a circle and it's going to cause compiler errors. So you don't want to do that. So for certain instances, you are going to want to just kind of put a couple of things at the top where we define it as a class and then you represent that as a pointer below. So I just wanted to mention that, that's very important. Um, but yeah, so we can see here, aliases are very simple. All an alias is, is a reference to another U-type. Because, I mean, that's what an alias is, right? Like, if you have an alias of, you know, foo, for instance, like if I, here's a better example. If I go to my support library, and I go to exceptions, we can see here I'm representing several classes as, you know, aliases. Well, what we're going to have is alias is just going to have the name and the reference to this class. So this illegal state exception class is defined up here. So it's going to reference the U type that we're going to create in our compiler. So that's going to be very nice. That's kind of how aliases work. And yeah, so we have that. Of course, we have a free. We'll just call U type dot free. We'll go over what U type free does in a little bit. 
But as we can see here, when we set up our alias, we just you know call the base constructor and we set our uType to null. Otherwise, we have information that's very important for our alias. So every alias, just like everything else, is going to have a generated unique ID, uh, GUID, and we're going to set that as our serial number here. And of course, we're going to need to know what the name of our alias is, what class owns the alias, and any flags that it has. So yes, aliases can have flags, because when you define an alias, right, you can have public or private aliases, and if you don't want uh, some other class to access an alias that you created inside of your class, totally fine, right? We want to allow the user to do that. After that, we have metadata. So where was the alias defined? Because of course you can define multiple aliases and we want to make sure that the user doesn't uh, define multiple of the same names. So we're going to do our normal setup and then we just assign all of our values. So that's going to be it for that. Finally, let's look at uType. Now, if you look at uType, we're going to have multiple different types of uTypes. So if you remember from the picture, we're going to have fields, classes, methods, function pointers, native uTypes. Now, that's a little bit different. We'll get into what native uTypes are in a little bit. But basically, like if you have a type of a var, that's a native type. So we're just going to create a native uType. And of course, we have literals and unresolved. So those are going to be all of the various types in our entire type system that the user can process or that the compiler can process. So first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to need to create a bunch of injectors. Now, what these are, these are native strings. Now, what a native string is, I've had issues in the past with strings inside of malloc um, data structures because I'm not correctly initializing the string. They're not getting correctly initialized. So I ended up creating my own string class, uh, and it basically just allows you to do the same stuff that you could do on a regular string. So you can find that in... That's in the lib runtime symbols string. So if you go to lib and then runtime symbols, and then you have where this is in my runtime system, by the way, it's not in the actual uh, grammar portion, but you can go to string.h and that's where it is. Um, so you guys can copy that down or check out the code. I don't really want to go through it to make this video too long, but I'm pretty sure you understand what it does. It doesn't do anything crazy. It just basically... You know, if you want to set a uh, array of characters, it, it just basically tries to figure out how big the, you know, set of strings are. And then it like, you know, either has nothing or you do a memory copy of the data. So it's a very simple class. But if we go back to our alias, you can see here that we have, where is that in our grammar file, backend, data, alias, or uType, my bad. So if we go to our uType, C++, you can see I created a bunch of strings. And what they represent are, they represent names for injectors. Now, injectors are a bit of a complicated topic. I don't want to go over it right now. Uh, it's basically just a way for us to dynamically inject code. It's a very powerful tool. We're definitely going to need it for later on in the YouTube series. But for right now, just create these strings. As you can see here, you can pause the video and copy those down. After that, let's go back. So if we look here, we have a basic constructor where we just initialize all of our values. So we're going to need to have a code holder. Now you can you can uh, create this class code holder that is located inside of code. And it's you know so it's in my lib grammar backend code code holder. If you guys want, you can just go to that file and copy this down. Uh, this is a very very cool class, and we're going to be using it a ton in our compiler but we don't really need it for now. And considering that this isn't really connected 100% to the type system, uh, we can just kind of ignore it for now. But if we go back to our uType, we can see once we you know, have that, we have two more constructors. So these are like what's called fast constructors. So whenever we want to create a uType of a class or we want to create a uType of some you know, other data type, then we can just call this. So first, let's look at the class one. So if we want to create a class uType, we can say whether or not it's an array and you know we pass it we say that u type is a u type class we say you know whether or not it's an array also by the way here i'm going to do this really quick so we can just kind of look to see what the fields are so we have you know u type struct which is basically representing the data structure that we're holding so if we go back so as you can see we have this data entity field called resolve type and that's a data entity but we have all of these classes that basically compile to or basically inherit this data entity class. So we want to basically know what structure is that pointer representing. 
After that, we have whether or not it's an array, and after that, whether or not it's a null type. That's going to be for our compiler. We need that for later on. We're passing nulls around in our programming language. And yeah, so if we go back to this, so if you want to create a class U type, all you do is just say U type class as the type of data structure. Whether or not it's an array, you pass in the resolve type of the class object. And as you can see, C resolves this pointer, and it works fine with you know assigning this pointer to this pointer because in memory, the way it works is here. If I go to paint, what C does to the V table, which is short for virtual table at the low level, it's very similar to what our programming language is going to do. Um, paint, why is it not? Okay, so if we do an example here basically the way it's going to work is you have your shapes square and this shape is going to represent the class so this is going to represent the class object so if i go back to where is it you type cpp so when we assign this class pointer to this data entity pointer we have this blue section representing the class object pointer and then we have the data entity pointer representing this portion so, you know, obviously the data entity is going to hold the bulk of all of the information. And when we reference it, we're just referencing it starting right here at this point instead of starting right here at this point of the address. So that's how that works if any of you guys are wondering. But after that, we have, you know, of course, it's not a null type if we're setting it as a class type and we initialize our code holder. And of course, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. But if you want to create this function, all it does is just initialize certain fields and that's it. After that, we have a data type. Now, this is going to be where we have what's called a native U type. So if we want to create like an integer or a var or something, we're just going to create a new data entity. And the type of this resolve type is going to represent whatever data type we passed in. So here's another perfect example of why we use data entity instead of, you know, like all these random types. Because it allows us to specify whatever data we're trying to process. doesn't matter. So let's go back and all right, so we're going to have a ton of functions. Uh, first, we're going to need to set the type of our U type. We're going to need to set the resolve type. Um, oh, this is so stupid. OK, uh, I'm going to remove that code. You can ignore that. So we need to set the resolve type. We're also going to want to get the type of the value because, of course, these values are private. We want to set whether or not it's an array type, check to see if it's an array. We want to check and set uh, whether or not it's a null type. We want to check to see if it's a class. So this is a cool one. So what we're going to do is we're going to check the type of the U-type and say if it's a U-type class or if it is a U-type field. And we cast this get resolve type to the field pointer. And this is why it's completely safe because we know what data set we're processing. And we get the U-type out of the field and we check to see if that is a class. Now, we need this because if we're processing something on our back end of our compiler and we need to check to see if we have a class type in our U type, and this is just a quick way to do it, then, you know, we can call this function. Um, so I use this a ton and in tons of spots. So there's that. Of course, we also have get class. So it's kind of similar. Uh, so we check to see if the U type is a class. If it's not, return null. Otherwise, if the type is equal to a class, then we just cast the resolve type to a class object. Otherwise, then we basically cast the resolve type to a pointer field, get the U type, and call get class. Now, I know you may be thinking, well, this might be unsafe to do because what if the U type isn't a U type field? Well, it is a U type field because if we have this returning true, if you remember, the only way this is going to return true is if the U type is either of a type class or if it's a type field, and that field is in fact a class. So that basically in it of itself guarantees that this will be a view type field. So this is perfectly safe to do. After that, we have get method. This is another one I use all over the place. Uh, so what this allows us to do is check to see if we have a U type method or a U type function pointer. If so, we cast the resolve type as a method. Otherwise, if it's a field, then we cast the field, get the type of that field, and try to get the method in there. So we want to get the type of the field. Otherwise, we just return null. Oops, let's go back. Uh, all right, so after that, we want to get the resolve type. So what is the data that we resolved in our compiler? We want to get the cold holder. And of course, we want to get a reference to it. That's why we say and. We also want to call free. This is kind of a light way to do it. Uh, so basically, whenever we free up a U type, we call, you know, code.free. We free up the code holder. And yeah, so go back. So that's that. 
We also have, I'm going to skip over two string. That's a little bit of a longer one. I'm going to skip over these two as well. Finally, we have copy. So this is a light way of copying a U-type. Instead of like copying the pointer directly, instead we want to, you know, pass in a pointer and just copy the data that it has. So it just copies all these fields. Now, finally, this is where we get to some of the magic with parsing U-types. And this is how I get beautiful errors in my programming language. So here, I'm actually going to demonstrate one error for you guys to show you how nice some of these error messages are. So if I go to, I'm going to close out of this. I'm going to scroll down here. And where is it at? So it's in the support library, 0805. Go to platform, kernel, platform. So I'm going to actually kind of revert this data. All right, so I'm going to revert this stuff. And now I have, you know, these two functions. So what these functions are, or this is how I initialize my runtime environment. So this function basically allows me to initialize all static fields, anything static, basically, in the programming language. This also allows me to initialize my thread local storage system. So I don't have this function built yet, SRT init. It doesn't do anything. I'm just testing uh, instructions for now, as you can see. But... I'm going to print a error here. So I'm going to say i is equal to 0. Now, because this function basically is used to initialize my static data in my programming language, you cannot put anything in here because the compiler, as it's compiling it, is going to be generating code to be injected into this function. And we don't want the user putting crap in here and screwing that up. So if I go here and hit play, it's actually going to complain about this and say that I cannot put anything inside of this function. So let's see what actually happened. Okay, so as you can see here, we have, you know, here's where it happens. So if I click this, uh, it actually brings me here. And also, by the way, the reason why this works, uh, this is supported by CLion. I made the format of my errors in this format. So that way, when I get the errors printed out to the console in C line, I can just click on it. Uh, so the way you want to do it is you want to say, you know, where's the path to the file? And then you want to put a colon, the line that it was declared on, colon, the comma, and then another colon. Now, we've already gone over my type system anyway, but I just thought that was kind of cool to mention. But if I click on this, we can see here it says platform level function, and then it prints out the exact data of the function. So we can see here, function platform dot kernel hashtag platform dot static init so this platform class which owns this function now i know some of you are wondering why doesn't it say uh, platform kernel hashtag srt global dot platform we'll go over that a little bit later you'll understand why it doesn't say that so we can see here that it prints out perfectly you know that this is a function it prints out the you know what module is defined in you know, what is the what is the class it was defined in, and then what was the name of the function, and then it even prints out the type of this. So that's really cool. If we go to the U-type, we can go to toString, and this is how I figure it out. So I have this big function here where I call toString, and, you know, I create a string stream, and I check to see if the resolve type is null. If so, we just put question mark. Um, otherwise, we say, you know, we do a switch on the type. So if we have a native type, you do a switch on the type of the resolve type, and we say, you know, whatever the type is. I mean, you can see it here. We support native types of int8 to int64, uint8 to uint64, var, object, nil, and function pointers. If it's a function pointer, we cast the resolve type to a method pointer, and we call toString on that method. We'll go over that function in a little bit. And finally, we have default as undefined, just as a catch-all, just in case. Um, after that, we have whether or not it's an array. So if our U-type is an array, we have, you know, this here. Now, another thing I want to mention, the reason why array is plastered here instead of inside of data entity is it's very important. When we're processing things in our compiler, like, for instance, if we're processing this var, right? Well, this is a specific type in and of itself, but var inherently is not an array. The only thing that makes it an array is if I plaster an array you know, symbol immediately after the type. But the type itself is not an array. And if we want to be able to reuse addresses and, you know, save memory by just passing around data entities all over the place instead of having to create a new data entity every time we want to process a type, then that's why we put array outside of the data entity class in order to make sure we don't have that problem. So just keep that in mind. I had an issue like that on my last compiler and it was a pain in the ass. So um, there's that. 
So now if I go back, where were we? So we're in the two string, and I can see, so I have this type here. So we have our uType class, and you know all we do for a class type is we just say, what is the full name of the class? And whether or not it's an array, you know, put the array thing here. Uh, same thing for field, we just cast a resolve type to a field, two string, array pointer there. And if we have like a method or a function pointer, again, cast it to a method, two string, array. Finally, we have literal, we cast it to a literal, and you know, we check to see if it's a numeric literal. We basically say, um, you know, left bracket literal, and then we, you know, cast the resolve type to a literal, and then we, you know, get the numeric data, and then we close it up. Otherwise, if it's a string literal, then we say literal, you know, cast it again, and then string data, and then we close it up. That's that. And then finally, if we've gone through all this and we still haven't figured out what it is, it's just undefined. So yeah, that's that. And then of course we just return ss.string, so we convert our string string to a string to be processed later. Let's go back to this. Let's go to equals. So now there's going to be two main ways that I check to see if things are equal in my programming language. Uh, this video is going to be really freaking long. Let me see how long has it been going for. Okay, that's that's going to be long. I'm probably going to have to do a part two. I'm going to finish up on equals, and then we'll do a part two, and we'll continue on it tomorrow. But I'm going to finish up with equals, and then tomorrow we'll talk about how to create all the classes for our object-oriented data structure. So I think doing this whole folder here is kind of a good point to stop. But as I mentioned, there's two main ways that we want to resolve data. So if we have a foo, foo, right? So let's define foo. And let's define, you know, a field here. So in of a class called A. So let's create two classes here. So let's say class A and let's say class B. And B inherits A as a base class. And of course, you know, so that's going to be the format. So let's say we have this function of foo and, you know, we call foo. And then we pass in a new A class here. And, you know, of course, obviously, we know what's going to happen, right? This is a U-type of class A, so it's very easy to resolve this. But what if we do a new B? Well, how exactly is this going to work? Well, B, like, there's no direct function where we have exactly this B-type. So we have to check to see if B is related to A, which it is because B inherits A. So that's why we have two different types of functions. So let's check out both equals and is related, and then we just kind of stop here. So we have equals, where we check to see if we have a type method or a type function pointer. Now, there's going to be two main ways we check for things in our programming language. We're going to have what's called a simple parameter match and a complex parameter match. Now, if we go back, um, so first thing we're going to want to do is get the method. You know, we're going to call get method of this U type, and of course, that's going to work because this U type's type is a type method, um, or it's a type function pointer, which both of them are going to represent the method class, so that's totally fine. Then, after that, we basically check to see if U type dot get method. So, if the U type that we passed in has a method, right? So, if we call get method on that, like, because this U type theoretically can be anything. So, if this returns non null, so we say get method is not equal to null and you know then we do what's called a simple parameter match on that function or on those two parameters then we're good to go now here's where it gets a bit weird so we check to see if the return type that's what u type is going to represent and we'll go over this uh in the method class in a little bit that's going to be what the return type of the method is we check to see if that's not null and we also get the return type of this u type that we passed in if that's not equal to null, then we process, you know, this function or this if statement. Otherwise, we have an or here where we check to see if the return type of the current type that we're in, of the current instance, is equal to null. And the return type of the data that we passed in is also equal to null. Then that will also be a valid, um, you know, check here. And we'll just return true there. After we do that, then we check to see if the we get the return type of you know the current instance. We check to see if it's not equal to null, and if it is, we know that the other one's also not equal to null. Now the reason why I didn't just do like get method u type is equal to you know this u type is because they're going to be referencing two separate u types. They're going to be completely different, so they're never going to be equal to each other. So that's why I do these double checks here, which is kind of weird. But 
you know, then we check to see if the return types are equal to each other. So we just call back into this function and that's it. After that, we check to see if, you know, the types are equal to each other. So if they're not, you know, function pointers, then, you know, the data types must be exactly the same. So are they both objects? Are they both vars? You know, all that other stuff. And we check to see if the type is not equal to unresolved. And if so, we process to see whether or not they're equal. Otherwise, we return true. Now, the reason why is because if they're both unresolved, I mean, technically they're equal. So we don't really want to spend any time like trying to check to see, you know, is it a native, a class, a field, because it's none of those. Uh, so we can safely return true there. So we have a case where we have, you know, whether or not it's a native type. If so, we check to see if the resolved type's data type is equal to the resolved type's data type of the U type. So this is for like native types. Then we also check to see if whether or not they're both an array. So if, you know, this current instance, if the left side of the U type is not an array, and this, which is called like the right side of the U type, like if we were trying to assign this to this current instance, if that is an array, then obviously they're not going to be equal to each other. So that's why I just say whether or not they're equal. After that, we have class. So if it's a class, then we check to see if the classes match. So we cast, you know, this resolve type to a class object and this one to a class object. Check to see if they match. And we also check to see the same thing up here if the arrays match as well. Now, all match does is it just it's a function inside of the class object class. And we'll go over that tomorrow, but it basically just, you know, checks to see if this class is not equal to null. And it compares, again, the serial numbers because if you have the exact same serial number, then that guarantees that these classes are the same. Because theoretically, you could have two classes with the exact same name, and, and it would just be very confusing. So we want to be absolutely sure that the classes are, in fact, the same. After that, we check to see if we have a U type of field. And if so, we just you know get the result type, and we check what we call equals on there. So all that does is that does some other fancy stuff, which we'll go over tomorrow. After that, we just return false. Obviously, we just don't know what it is. Now let's look at now let's look at simple parameter match. All this does is it takes two lists of fields, and you know so each method is going to have a list of fields representing each parameter that we're going to be accessing later on in our programming language when we process or compile fields. <coughs> Again. This is going to, it's really hard for me to kind of explain all this stuff because there's a lot of things that aren't done. So hopefully you guys can bear with me, but we will get to everything. It's, we will get to everything. We're kind of getting ourselves out of the chicken and the egg problem right now of how do you build a programming language that doesn't exist yet. So it's going to be a bit bumpy for the next couple of episodes. But, but as you can see here, we passed two parameters. All we check to see is do we have the same size? Obviously, if you're checking parameters, if the sizes are different, they aren't equal. And then literally all we do is we just, you know, for loop through all the parameters and we check to see if they're equal. That's it. And that calls the equals not inside of uType, but inside of the field. Field has its own equals method and it's and it has that for a reason. So we'll go over that, like I said, tomorrow. But that's how you process a simple that's how you process a simple parameter match. Uh, after that, we have is related. Now this one is really complicated. So let's see, do we have anything else? Is this the last thing we're going to talk about today? Yeah. So we have our, you know, resolve type. So you check to see if our resolve type is not equal to null. And then we check to see if we have U type. Now, first thing we do is we check to see if we can get a class. We call this get class function. If we have a class, then we check to see if, you know, this, the right side of our, of our type is a class as well. If so, then we basically check to see if the classes are related. Now, if it's not, then we check to see if the right side of our type is a null type. And that's why I have this Boolean here, because the way null types are going to be represented when we have like U types that we pass back, it's going to be represented as an object. But objects and null types are two different things, because null types are compatible with any object. But objects are not compatible with everything, if that makes any sense. So we'll see a little bit more of that as we go along, but yeah, so that's why we want to check that. Now, when we have our class related, so we're going to check to see, we're going to get the current class, and then we're going to get the class of the right type, or the right side of the type we're processing, and check to see if they're related. What that's going to do in our class object function is that's going to basically take a current class and have a Boolean called interface check. 
And what that allows you to do is check to see, you know, if we also have an interface as well. So of course, the first thing we're going to want to do is check to see if the class is equal to null. If so, then they're not related. Otherwise, we check to see if the classes match. If they match, well then great, they're, they're also related because they're directly equal to each other. Finally, what we do is we do an interface check, and if that Boolean is set to true, then, and I think in this case it's set to false, right? Is class related? What's the default value? Okay, so interface check is defaulted to true. So what we do is we basically for loop through all the interfaces, which is just a list of class objects, and our class object class, and we basically check to see if the classes are related. And with interfaces, it's going to be interesting, right? So like if we have three interfaces inherited, what it's going to do is it's going to for loop through all of those and then go all the way up the ladder and check all the super classes of every single interface to see if that class is related to it. Um, so, you know, we check to see if the super is not equal to null, then we return false because obviously if we're down here and there's no super class, then it's not related. Otherwise, then we return, you know, whether or not the class is related based on the super class. And eventually we'll get to a point to where, like, you know, we'll see that in our example here. So if I go back down to platform and we're passing in B, well, B has a super class of A. A matches class of A, which, you know, matches this field here or this parameter. Therefore, you know, the class is related. So that's kind of how it works. Um, so there's that. After that, we have our object. So if it's an object, objects are a bit weird. Now, if some of you guys are wondering where I'm getting all these weird ass rules from, uh, if you're gonna start to notice some weird ass rules in my programming language, I'm actually pulling these from real compilers. Like I've actually done testing for hours on multiple different compilers. I've tested it on C Sharp. I've tested Java's compiler. I've tested Kotlin amongst others to see exactly what they do and don't allow the user to do whether or not it makes ethical sense. Um, so I'm just basically copying at that point. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. You just want to copy what other compilers do and then you know do the other unique things that your language is going to provide later on. So we check to see if we have an array. So if we have an object and it's an array versus not an array, you can assign it various different things. So objects, the way they're going to work is it's very weird, but you can assign objects classes or array types or string types, but you can't assign it a direct integer because the way that those data sets are processed at the low level, they're completely different. Like if it's a native integer, it's not going to work. If it's an array, that means it's an object that has cells that you have to access specifically. This goes into memory modeling. Honestly, in order for me to build this function, I actually had to build my virtual machine first. So it's a little bit easier for me. I know it's kind of hard. I'm struggling to explain this, but I'm just going to explain it. If you guys have any questions, just write them in the comment section below. So if our object is an array, then we check to see if our write type that we're processing is an array. And it's either a class or it's an object. Then we return true. Otherwise, it must be a null type. Because if you have an object array, it needs to represent an array of objects, right? So it either has to be a class or an object. An int array is not an object array because each cell inside of that integer array is an integer and not like a class or an actual object. So that's why we do that. I can't wait for us to get past this. This is painful. It's agonizing. Um, so after that, we have whether or not the right type that we're processing is a var. If so, then we basically say whether or not it's an array. Because as I just mentioned, you cannot assign single integer values to an object. So after that, we have our checks for var. Uh, so we have, we check to see if the resolve type of the current instance is a var, or if it's between an int 8 and an int 64. And if so, we check to see if the write type that we're processing is between an int 8 and a var. So I don't, you know, actually, I can just check to see if the write type is just less than or equal to a var. Um, so that's totally fine. So if it's less than or equal to a var, then we return whether or not it's an array. Obviously, if you have an integer that's not an array and you're assigning it to an array object of integers, then that doesn't work. And if you notice, we're also supporting function pointers because, like I said, function pointers are numbers at the end of the day. So we're going to have some weird stuff in our language, but, I mean, it logically will make sense. and We'll see as it progresses why we do certain things certain ways. After that, if, you know, our current var type is an array and it's a null type, then we return true. And of course, I didn't put that code inside of equals because you want equals to be direct. 
you want it to be exactly equal to the thing that you're processing. You don't want it to be kind of equal to it. That's why I have this is related function. So you want to make sure you make that distinction. Finally, we have whether or not we have a method or a function pointer. If so, then we you know check to see if the right type that we're processing is a function pointer or if it's a method. If so, then we do a simple parameter match. We, we get the current method and parameters of the current type, and then we get the method parameters of the right type that we're processing, and we check to see if those simple parameters match. Otherwise, if you know the right type that we're processing is a null type, and you know we are an array, so like if we have an array of function pointers and we're assigning it to null, then that's perfectly fine. And yeah, so we'll have that. Of course, we can't have like legally we cannot have an array of methods in our programming language. This like if statement will only work for if we have a function point. And finally, we check to see if we have a nil. So if the current type that we're processing is of type nil, then we must check to see that the right type that we're processing is a nil because nothing else is equal to nil or related to nil but nil. So that's what that is. So that's going to be it for today, guys. This was quite a lot to go over, and we still have quite a lot to go over in our object-oriented section. So we'll continue on that tomorrow and finish up you know, setting up our type system. Hopefully that made sense. As usual, if you guys have any questions, definitely put them in the comment section below. And of course, if you guys would love to help support the channel, definitely head over to my GitHub repository at AndroidFCD slash Sharp. When you do, definitely watch Star and Fork this repository. That's going to give this repository a lot more visibility and let other developers know this language exists. Also, if you're curious about maybe learning what I'm doing on a daily basis, you can check out the remastered branch. And in there, you can check out the commits. I write some pretty wordy commits, and I've been committing quite a lot lately. Uh, now, my last couple of commits have been just... <laughs> they've been interesting. Um, I've had some pretty crazy stuff, but you can kind of get a gist of what I've been doing without really having to look too much into the code. Also, if you're curious about learning maybe some of the things that I'm looking to add into the future for this language in the tutorial series, you can check out the docs folder and the remastered branch. And there's two main files. There's the changes file, which basically holds all of my previous updates in the programming language, and the roadmap file, which contains both that and stuff that I'm looking to add in the future. So that's going to be it for today. As usual, if you guys are new to the channel, definitely consider subscribing, and until next time, I'll see you guys later.